Welcome, welcome, welcome to another lesson. I'm Brett Papa, and today I'm going to just answer a bunch of questions I get. But before we do that, I want to let you all know that I'm having a yearly membership sale at a massive discount. I know a lot of you also ask about the membership and what's included. So there's 990 videos. It's freaking enormous. 145 hours of content instructional courses from me. You get all of my courses, plus the courses from Tim Pierce, Corey Congelio. There's a Jeff Mackerling course inside. It's humongous. So if you want the uh, best deal, the bang for the buck, the membership is the way to go. Plus, if you get it now, it locks in the yearly membership price forever. So if you decide to renew, it's going to be at this price forever as long as you stay current. Now, there is a link down below, so make sure you check that out. And I just want you to let you know that all of what you see here and all these videos that I'm able to do for free are all brought to you by your support at brettpapa.com. I can't even say my own name. Brett Papa. Yes, that's my name. Brettpapa.com. <laughs> okay, so question number one I get a lot is tone. Okay, so I can't go over all of the tone ideas I have here in you know, one short video and get to a bunch of questions. But I will say this, nine times out of 10, on all of the heads that I use, every dial on the amp is set somewhere between four and six. That's always my starting point. I find generally, if you take an amp and you set the knobs straight up, meaning like, you know, 12 o'clock if we're using a clock, then that's a good place to start just to see what's what the amp can really do. Now, I find with my own playing, I don't tend to use a ton of bass because there's a bass player. So in my particular situation, I usually have the bass like kind of back way off. I mean, if you're going to use like a one to ten scenario, then it would be on like three. And I find that something like mid range is very important to me because that's what really helps punch through with the you know guitar frequency spectrum. So I always like to have my mids around six, treble the same way. If there's presence, that's usually between like four and six. Um, I don't like a ton of that, um, but that's typically where I go. And then since I use the auxes behind me, the universal audio auxes, I don't have any cabinets going now. There's been thousands of videos where I have used a cabinet but in about the last three years, I don't use cabinets anymore just because I, I don't have to. And it really helps tame the volume here in the studio. So if I have a guest or something, it's not like typical Guitar Wars, right? So I have the amps master volume typically on like 10, you know, because in, in a lot of the amps that I use, once the master volume's on 10, the master volume circuit is out. And it's really just like having an old school Marshall where you just have like the one preamp or the one volume, and that's what you get, right? I wanna be able to hear the amp in its truest, most untamed nature. <laughs> so like on my Marshall, I got the gains on like six, you know, uh, on my divided by 13s, I have the regular volume on 10, and then I use the preamp gain somewhere around like five. And that's what an RSA 23, like the amp I originally started out with, they never had a master volume. So once you start getting it up to like that, four to six range it was really like that's the sound because remember in a tube amp scenario the power tubes the back end tubes are such a humongous component in the actual tone itself i found over the years once i had the auxes too and i was able to crank the amp it's like oh there's that sound i was looking for i need the back end and then that allows you to actually use less preamp gain 
and less, you know, I would say compressed kind of gain. You get a more open, big, full sound that really represents truly what the amp is supposed to sound like. Now with each amp, it's different. Some, when you put them on 10, it just, it starts to break up too much. So you gotta find the amp sweet spot, but you gotta get the back end of a tube amp cooking. Now, there is some great amps out there now. The divided by 13s I use a lot. Uh, the Freedmans I use a lot. There's a lot of amps out there that really have a great master volume circuit or some way to you know power condition the amps. I got a Lazy J, J20 back there, which is a freaking fantastic amp. And it has its own built-in like power scaling feature to it. And that works great. I mean, the amp still sounds legit. Even if you turn it way down and squeeze the wattage of the amp down, it still remains that, you know, you still got that sound, that big sound. So there are ways to do that. But that being the heart of the tone, like I said, everything's usually somewhere between four and six always. Now, other than that, I usually like to use boost pedals, sometimes distortion pedals, or a combination of the two. This particular sound, check it out. It's actually a fuzz pedal and a boost pedal together. Now li listen to this. So here's the Marshall by itself. Right now, if I add the Rocket Audio, it's an Archer, but it's called the Jeff pedal, the Jeff Beck version of it. That's my favorite one. That's the one, the only Archer I use is that particular one. Not that the other ones aren't great, but for some reason, that frequency spectrum of that particular pedal is just like, home run. <laughs> I use this pedal all the time. I get like so heckled on my demo I did. I got the controls mixed up back in the day and I'm like, well, that makes sense because I never turn any knob anyways. I found like the settings that I like and I didn't even pay attention to what they were. I'm like, yep, that sounds good. And I've left it there. And that too, the two knobs on the top are straight up and the gain knob is really low. Like it would be like at two o'clock, right? So the secret to my tone and how I do everything, whether it's this kind of Hendrix stuff or the Van Halen kind of stuff is always lower amount of gain on the amp. You know, not, I never max it out. And then I let the boost pedal and an EQ pedal a lot of times uh, be set for a little tiny bit of gain because I just want to hit the front end of the amp a little bit. Sometimes I find that the pedals do it better than the preamp, right? There, there can be too much preamp and it'll start to break up. But if you don't, like the sound will start to like lose structure. So the... Um, you know, the the overall tone, I find you can shape better with a boost pedal and just get more of what you want out of the amp, but it, it hits the amp in a different way. And then a lot of times with the sound here, lately, uh, all my effects are in post, right? I listen to it through my monitors here with some reverb and delay, but I do all that stuff in post. And that's typically the Sunset Reverb by IK Multimedia. And I use a, uh, like a Echoplex tape simulation delay pedal uh, there's a great one by IK Multimedia. There's Universal Audio stuff is great. I use the Universal Audio reverbs all the time too because I go into an Apollo and I just love those. I like tracking stuff dry and then adding stuff later because then you can really dial in whatever it is you're looking for. So that's kind of the, the heart of how I always set everything. Every single amp I have is pretty much set the same way. I always find out that I, that's kind of what I like between four and six is where it's at for me. If I can put the master volume on 10 and it sounds good that way, then I'll keep it wide open. Okay, and so for guitars, I always use Lawler pickups. The only guitar of mine, or the only two guitars that don't have Lawler pickups are the Gold Top, which is just the Gus, uh, the Gibson P90s. It's their, you know, whatever pickup that is, whatever P90 they use. And then the Van Halen guitar I have is the stock Frankenstein pickup, which sounds fantastic, even though it's super high output. I usually don't like high output pickups, but all my strats, all my tellies, all that stuff, all Loller. I'm a Loller guy through and through. So that is the pickup question. This particular, all my, all my strats have different configurations, like the pink strat, has a Imperial low wind humbucker, and then it has two special single coils. They're like the hot rotted 60s version. And then the Tuttle 
has two specials and then a 64 in the neck. And then this one has like one of everything in it. I think it's like a, I think this is a special, this is a 64 and this is a blonde, right? So this is, this Strat sounds really great. This is a Jeffson Strat. Jeffson's an awesome, they're all Tuttle, all these Nash, they're all fantastic builders, especially for the money. They sound freaking amazing, right? So check it out. Here we go. I'm gonna add the Archer, the Jeff pedal. So there's not a lot of gain, right? It's not too bad. It sounds big though. Now that sounds like a ton. It's pretty clean. Listen, if I pick lightly. If I back off my volume just a hair. Now I like to use the guitar's volume because I find that I can set my sound kind of how I like to have it or as close to what I really want to get in the end result and use the guitar's volume so I don't have to step on a lot of pedals. Usually I set it for grip and rip it and grip it and rip it, I should say, and then work my volume just because it's so much easier for me. I'm like, I have enough trouble playing guitar than, I, than having to worry about stepping on pedals. So usually in a live scenario, the only pedals I'm going to be stepping on if I need them would be like a delay pedal. Okay, so, or a chorus or vibe or something. Speaking of which, this vibe, funky vibe, Sabadeus, oh Lord have mercy. Kick on the fuzz. Okay, so this is adding the fuzz. Check it out. Now that is the exact tone solutions, Iridium fuzz, my favorite fuzz, hands down. I love that fuzz. Now there are some others I really like. There's the King Tone fuzz, which is super cool. Um, there's the Burkos fuzzes that are great, but they're super, super expensive. Unfortunately, the Iridium fuzz by exact tone solutions isn't produced anymore. I'm trying to get them to remake it. Like, so hit them up and say, I hear you had a fuzz at one time that was amazing. How come you don't have it anymore? And when can you reproduce it? <laughs> it's the best fuzz ever, 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 ever. Um, but anyways, so that's what I use for the, the fuzz sound. And if you hear, you know, that's not set that fuzzy either. I want my fuzz to be fuzz, but still retain some like, I don't want to just like a spoon hitting mashed potatoes, like just bleep. I still want some clarity and some definition to the notes, I can always add more if I want. And that's why I like using a boost post fuzz is if I need more, I just kick on another pedal and it's like, suddenly it's there, right? <laughs> But I could turn on that fuzz and back this down and Uh, so anyways, you know, that, that's a, that's a huge thing of the Jimmy tone. People always ask me about the Jimmy tone. 
I usually nine times out of 10, I don't even use a fuzz. I use some sort of a Marshall type circuit and a boost pedal. Again, same kind of way with the boost pedals. I'll usually have, you know, like I, I love the Archer, which has the knobs straight up and the gain very low. Uh, the exotic RC booster is another favorite of mine. Again, all the knobs straight up with just a little bit of treble boost gain very low. I like the output a little bit higher than straight up. Like, so when I kick it on it, it actually has a volume jump, but there's that. And then there's pedals like the boss seven band EQ. Again, I use the exact tone solutions version. It's more guitar centric. I think uh, session guitarist, Tom Bukovac went in and said like, can you make a boss EQ pedal, but modify the EQ to be more guitar centric. And they did that. And that is a, you know, I find that pedal specifically too. I think that could be the overdrive of your dreams that you're really looking for <laughs> because like the shaping tonality possibilities are endless. And if you push the gain up on the actual boss pedal itself, it acts like a drive pedal. So this pedal, that particular pedal, it's on every session guy board in town. Like literally everybody has one of those things on their board because there's such a great shaping device and you can get one amp to sound like a lot of different amps, you know, as long as you're kind of, you can get it close. <laughs> so like talk about a sleeper pedal, like EQ pedal, get an EQ pedal on your board. You will not regret it. So. A lot of people have been asking me about the Panama Van Halen tone that I did a while back. If you haven't seen that lesson, check it out. It's like my most in-depth tutorial ever. But I did uh, Van Halen and I've done a few Van Halen songs where that pedal is really a huge part of the tone. An EQ pedal was a giant part of Eddie's original Brown sound. He had one of those MXR 10 bands and it really hits the amp in a particular way. Now, you know, Keep in mind, uh, everybody says they get the brown sound and get close and everybody, you can get close if you try, but you always have to keep in mind all the variables that are impossible to get. Like there was a killer room at Sunset Sound. I've been in the room. It's awesome. It sounds amazing. So the sound of the room itself, the sound of their plate, the sound of their mic preamps, the sound of the compressors they use, all of that stuff goes into getting a tone. So you can get stuff close, right? But to truly duplicate something, you know, and, and God, don't forget his hands, right? <laughs> That's the most important part. I'm sure he could sound like Van Halen out of a crate, you know? So it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. But keep in mind, bear in mind that there, you know, if you want to get that sound, and a lot of people have commented on, on how close they thought I got, it was a Marshall circuit and then I had that boss EQ and I took out a little of the bass and gave it like a reverse V, you know, so you get a little mids in there and stuff like that. And that really got me close. And then I used that rocket pedal again for a little extra front end mid range love. And that was how I got that sound. So next, and this also, all this stuff is covered in my yearly membership as well. All this equipment for the most part, except for, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> a lot of the equipment that, of mine that you can find in an actual music store is all on my Sweetwater page down below. So check that out. It does help me out a little bit, but I find that it was just one of the only places I could find all the gear that you can buy in a store. It's, they had it all. So down below is everything I use in my studio with the exception of the divided by 13 amps, Lazy J, the guitars, um, the Nashes, there's a great selection at Chica uh, Chicago, <laughs> I can't even say it. Chicago Music Exchange. Um, that's where I, I love to get Nashes. They have a great selection. There's other dealers out there too. Uh, Tuttles, the Tuttles I get directly from Tuttle himself. Um, I'm friends with him, so he's, he's awesome to me, but I think you can get, there's a couple of dealers for the Tuttles, but the links are down below. I don't make anything off any of the amps or guitars or anything. I just love all those guys and. They're awesome. And then the, all the Lola pickups I use are down below as well. So next would be actually playing. Like people ask me like, how do you know the fretboard? How do you make melodic solos? All that kind of stuff. So let's do a real crash course in 
learning how to target notes in a scale. Now, I always love to use the pentatonic scale as my starting point, okay? So I figured if you know major and minor pentatonic, there's typically only major and minor song progressions. So if you're like, it's a minor, and you know minor pentatonic of that key, you're 90% you're of the way there, right? So let's just take uh, E minor, for instance, okay? So let's assume that you know that first shape. <laughs> If you need to find the key you're using in any pentatonic, whether it be major or minor, there's a simple solution. Go to the low E string and find the note of the key you're in. So if it's A, find the A note. Now the next step is knowing whether the song is major or minor. Minor songs typically sound sad and major songs typically sound happier. Now finding this one note, you'll still get the same result. So check this out. If it's minor, then your first finger starts the pentatonic scale. Right, and that's A minor pentatonic. Now, if it's major, finding this note is great as well, and you would move that shape down three frets. Okay, now, but if you play it like this, It doesn't sound like A major. So to get your ear used to that, think of this note, the same A note, right? It goes, the, the shape goes like this. But start with this note, right? So now listen, watch. See how it sounds like A major now, right? It sounds happy and it sounds like the scale that fits over that chord. It's because I'm not starting with that low F sharp. Now check it out, if I did that same thing. Then it sounds like it fits, right? So you gotta get used to how to resolve in major or minor. Now how do you do that, right? And this is the secret to everything. And this is what you apply to that next step. You learn those scales. I would highly recommend learning all five of the pentatonic shapes. I believe in my course fretboard command, it's a free course available online. I believe I go over and give you all the pentatonic shapes. So look for that. It's usually in the description box below. Uh, or if you pick up the membership, all of this stuff is broken down. Again, there's 990 videos, 145 hours of content, jam tracks, like everything you would ever need in your life to get better is in there. Um, but anyways, so the trick to resolving so let's say we're in A. I know I said E, but A is right in the middle. It's easier. Okay, so here we go. A minor. How do you make A minor sound good when you have a chord progression going? Well, look at the chord inside of that scale. These are referred to as target notes. Now, all target notes are chord tones. All those are, are the notes of the chords inside your scale, right? So. Like. That chord's right there. So if you're jamming over an A minor. Why would a lick like that sound good? Well, it's because you've hit a number of the chord tones. Now to really hammer this method home, you gotta learn the cage system. I have a whole course on the cage system, but the cage system is will turn your life upside down in a good way. If you're frustrated with not being able to solo and improvise the way you want, this is the key. This is, it. it's worked for thousands of people. <laughs> Me included. Somebody told me, Guthrie Govan, like the shredder of all shredders, told me like, go learn the cage system. And I was like, why wasn't this the first thing somebody taught me when I went to go solo? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't invented then. But anyways, it's learning how to see chord shapes inside your scale. So if I take this first one and I bent that note, that's gonna sound killer over that chord because if you think about it, I bent that note up. I have an A minor chord right here. 
This would be the D shape. Think of a D chord, right? You've like got a capo. D minor chord shape. See that? You hear that all the time? That's just literally hitting an A minor chord. How about that Stevie Ray? That's the same thing. You're bending into a chord tone, you got an A minor here. So you're bending in. All right. That's the third of an A chord. And then here's the root. All those notes, chord tone, right? Chord tone. Chord tone. I could bend this up. All those notes except for that were part of that A minor chord. Right? Fifth, third. Root, fifth, root. Right? Root. Third, root, root. Right? So if you start to learn those cage shapes, that's going to show you where all the root, third, and fifth notes are in those scales of those chords in your progression, right? That's what a chord's made up of. You know, typical basic like cowboy chords like a C, G, D. That's all root, third, and fifth chords. There's only three notes to those chords and then they're just repeated, right? So that's the second thing, right? That, that really will get you there. It's first is, you know, obviously learning the scale and familiarize yourself with the shape, although you don't have to do that, but it's definitely helps. It's like a roadmap, right? And the, and the target notes are your destination and you're just looking to find where those notes are in the progression that you want to hit. Now check this out. If I were to go A minor and then I went to C to D and back to A minor. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that one shape still and I'm going to analyze. Okay, here's my C chord. Now look at all these notes right here. Of my C chord. All those notes are in that pentatonic shape, that first one. So I could go. C. Now, I'm hitting the fifth of that C chord, the root, right? And then to D, look at all those options I have. Okay, so D. Now that note, check that out when I did that. That note isn't in my pentatonic shape, but because I can see my chords, it is, right? And so that's how, if you take the pentatonic shapes and you start to infuse the chords from a progression inside them, you will start to see notes that aren't in the pentatonic scale. That's the notes of a mode. Okay, so you hear of like the Dorian mode, Phrygian, there's Lydian, there's Mixolydian, Aeolian, all these modes per se will be much better understood if you can see the chords in your progression all over the neck, because then you can, you can put the scale there, right? I, I could show you an A minor three note per string scale. <laughs> But unless I show you how to resolve to the correct tones in the progression, it's just a scale, it's just a shape. And you hear a lot of players do that. They're just noodling and endlessly rambling. And it sounds like they're running scales. And it's because in a sense they are and they're not 
stopping on the tones or the notes that really matter. So I could take So now that check that out. So we got now, why did that work, right? Check it out. This right here is part of this C chord right here. It would be called the E shape, right? But then I pulled off into the third. So here's the fifth, here's the third. And then when I hit that bent note, I'm bending into that D chord, which was next. I'm hitting the fifth. That's also a shared note of the A minor chord right here. So the secret to this whole system, the cage system, I would say if you learn the E, A, and D shapes of every chord, right, in the progression, you're gonna hit a home run. You're gonna be able to solo. And if you don't get nervous and freak out and you just stick to simple phrasing ideas, you're gonna land on your feet. It's gonna sound good. You add some bending, vibrato, that kind of stuff. It's gonna sound like you know what you're doing. So let me give you a quick example of that. So here's an E shape. The reason it's called an E shape is it looks like an E chord back here. Here's my capo, right? These three notes, looks like an E major chord, right? If I do that, looks like an E minor chord. E minor, E major, that's an E shape. A shape would be the typical A chord that you know. A major, A minor. Now to move this shape all up and down the neck, all I have to do is use my first finger as a capo. Say I want a D major or minor. I would find D and then I would make that major shape right behind there like it, like it would be with a capo. D major, D minor, right? A shape, right? We're basing it off of the shape of an A chord. Same thing with the D. So the D has its root on the D string. Here's a major, here's a minor. Okay, roots on the D. So if I want an A minor with a D shape, I'm gonna find that A note on the D string. And then just like a capo would be, right? There's a D minor shape, or I could make it major, right? And I would never use that whole shape like that. I would do it like this. Or <laughs> getting that capo finger in there is kind of cumbersome. But if you can do that, you're so far ahead of the game. So check this out. Same progression, A minor. Okay, now that lick right there, I use the second position. Okay, of the pentatonic scale. And when I wanted to think about the A minor chord, I used that D minor shape. Right, here's my root. That C chord came up and I realized I got a C right here. So I went third. Right? Fifth, root. Right? Because I went to D. Just a whole step up there.
right? I could use the scale so I could be like. And I could go. Right? And then that D. I could be like. Now the scale would be like this. But since I know the chord and I know that note is a legit note because it's the third of the D chord, it's got to work. I can use that note. Right? And this, I just filled in the gap. That note right there would be called the flat five. I hear that all the time. Okay, so let's say I wanted to change it and I wanted to play major, right? What if I had chords like this? F, C, G. I know in my mind, this sounds like home bass. So I'm gonna be thinking G major again. Now I gotta watch out for this. Okay, so. Nope, that's outside of my scale, but it sure does sound good. Right, and know that the E shape and the D shape are always right next to each other. Okay. There's my C. No, it's out of the pentatonic scale too. There's my G, okay? So I could go up here, like where my D chord is. That's a G, but it's a D shape. And then I can find where those other two chords. Oh, there's my F chord, A shape. Where's my C? Oh, right there. Back to G. So check that out. So. Right? So here's my. Right, that's my F. Here's my G. Right? Based off that chord. And I'm bending into this G right here. Right, I could go. I could use more of an arpeggio of that F chord. That's from that C shape. All I'm doing is targeting a G here, here. I got a C right here. Got an F here. I got an F here. Right, so that makes me think, oh. Right, and that's more than. I can put that inside of that scale, that minor pentatonic scale, because we chill on this G for a while. It sounds kind of rock and roll, but if I throw in those F and C chord tones, then it starts to all come together. So check this out. So we got. Now I could go back to major, right? So. And then there's my G.
Okay, so <laughs> I would say those are the questions I get asked all the time, right? What about your tone? What about your scale use? How do you see the fretboard? How do you solo melodically? How do you add feel? Again, all of this stuff. I answer all of this stuff in my courses, but the membership, which is on sale this weekend, 40% off, you lock in that price for life, 990 videos, seriously, 990. And then there's like, I think there's like another 150 coming soon because I have some other courses coming out soon. Probably more like 200. 145 hours, which will be, God, way over that by the time these other courses come out. There's so much stuff. It's not just me. It's Tim Pierce, Corey Congelio, Jeff McLean. All of the, our courses are inside there. So there's literally like all of this stuff gets answered. Plus you get all my courses, Caged Unleashed, which goes over all of what I've just been talking about, but like in depth in a way that totally makes sense with jam tracks. So you can apply the knowledge that you've learned. And then there's all sorts of tone stuff in there. Man, the Tim Pierce stuff is insane. He's like one of the top 10 session guitar players ever. And he breaks down how he uses gear and guitar and amp combinations and how he sees the fretboard. And Corey Congelio, ripping blues player, like how he is able to infuse, you know, uh, major arpeggios and dominant seven this and that and chords and turnarounds and all sorts of stuff to like give you a humongous blues foundation. And then we got players like Jeff Mackerlane, who's just amazing player in his own right. He plays with Robin Ford, for God's sakes, <laughs> who is not a slouch if you haven't seen him. But he's an amazing guitar player, too. And he is really good at like copying. He's got his own great, fantastic style, but incredible at like going over other people's styles. So like Beck, you got uh, Paige, Clapton, Gilmore. He rips it like really hammering in on how to do that kind of stuff. So he shows you how to do that. He's got a rock course coming out that's amazing. That'll be incredible too. And you get 25% off all of the in guest instructor courses as well that are not in the membership. So anytime you see a guest instructor course, you get 25% off plus whatever it's on sale for. So if it's on sale for 30% off, it's 55% off for you. So anyways, that's just the benefit of the membership. I don't like to get on here and sell all the time, but this is how I do make my living. This is how I'm able to provide all of these thousands of free videos, how I'm able to bring in all these different guests. I got a bunch of killer guests coming in, how I'm able to pay for guests to come in and make courses. All that stuff is from your support at brettpapa.com. All of this is because of you, and it's just amazing for all, the, all of you out there that have supported me in the past. This is your empire as well. So thank you so much for that. Check it out. If you miss this weekend's sale, I'll keep a live sale link. It might not be the same price, but I'll keep a discount membership code down there. If you want to go deep in all of this stuff, again, it's all covered in the membership. I'm constantly adding stuff. Like I said, there's probably going to be another couple hundred videos popping in there very soon as well. Plus, we got another bunch of great courses coming out from some monster players like Mark Lettieri. Oh my God. <laughs> I was like, took my guitar after he left. I'm just like out the window. I don't need this anymore. I just give my stuff to him because, because he's way better. <laughs> Plus we got bass. We're not going to just stick to guitar. We're going to bring in a bass player, Ryan Medore, who's amazing. Also plays with Robin Ford. Amazing bass player to really like, my goal is to help you become a creative guitar player, not just copying other people's licks, but actually move to that next step of creation. I think that's really, at the end of the day, the most rewarding thing. It's really fun to be able to play somebody's solo note for note and get it to sound good, but it's nothing in comparison to being able to really make something of your own out of nothing. That is like so rewarding, even if it sucks. It's like you created something out of nothing. You can always make it better. And the tools and the membership will help you to do that. You guys are amazing. Thank you so, so, so much for the continued support. If you have any questions, let me know down below in the comments section. Also, my gear is down there at the Sweetwater page. <laughs> like fumbling all over the place today. The Sweetwater page. And then also down below, there are some other links to the guitars and the amps and all that kind of stuff, pickups. So I try to let you know everything I'm using down below, so check that out. But don't forget the membership is right down there. Click that link, enter the coupon code 40 for life at checkout. All right, you guys are amazing. Thank you so, so much for the continued support. We'll catch you next time.